Hi, I'm Tom Gelly, and you're about to watch a presentation on accelerated learning. And it's based on my own experiences as well as research I've done to help me improve my own skiing and others all around the world. I'm a level four instructor. I own Big Picture Skiing, which is a company that teaches people how to ski and improve skiing online. And so much of this stuff is really important. So I want you to write down some notes, turn off your phone, get rid of any distractions because what you're about to hear isn't very long, but it's really important. Because the thrill of getting better with your skiing and whatever you do is so rewarding. And so if you want to continue doing that over and over again, I suggest you listen to the key points, try it out this winter. And if you uh, do well with it, you're going to create a habit that not only just gets you through this winter with some progress, but then is repeatable for future seasons beyond uh, this one. So I hope you enjoy this and you get something out of it and it helps accelerate your learning and your progression in your own skiing. Season 2023 coming up in Australia and James Compton and I, I, I said to him, hey James, would you be interested in me presenting some information around learning and things that uh, I myself have kind of found have helped over the years and of recent um, with not only my own skiing, but others. And so that's the, that's kind of the context of this. And I really hope that uh, listening to this, watching this, you walk away with some ideas on what to do this season to help your own skiing improve and others. A quick brief history. Um, and you might understand why this is, in, I'm putting it in here, but basically I started alpine skiing when I was 22 years old. And so I did a bit of cross country skiing growing up, but skiing was, you know, I didn't do racing or anything like that. So I came to it later in life, but really fell in love with it. And then, you know, not too long after, uh, in 2009, I got my level four, uh, alpine certificate. So sort of over this course of sort of eight back to back winters, I ended up with my full cert and then was headed to um, into ski a couple of years later for, for telemark skiing. And so I say that because um, that's definitely, you know, from what I've under understand, like a fairly fast journey in uh, taking a sport and really improving my skills at it. Um, and not only my own skills, but the ability to teach. So with that aside, uh, I'm going to just give you some things that I think uh, personally I've found helped, help to understand and help to actually action, um, as well as what some really smart people in the world have figured out in terms of learning and uh, we might even talk a little bit about, about flow state. But the first thing to realize is like getting better most of it feels like a struggle. <laughs> like that's a really important thing to get up front because I think you talk to any great athlete, great business person, whatever, it wasn't all easy street to get there. In fact, like usually far from it. So first of all, you just want to understand this is a good thing. Say you're, you're in the middle of the season and you're trying to work on something or you're trying to work on something with another person and it feels like a struggle it means you're in the right place. Okay. Um, and like when we are struggling with something, it actually primes the brain um, with chemicals to help us problem solve. So getting in that space gets you, the, the juice is flowing. So when you're sort of agitated, annoyed, struggling, these are good things that um, will lead perhaps not right in that moment, but will, lead to something changing uh, soon after. So with that, um, if, if struggling is kind of important and, and uh, that's just part of the process, something I found out more recently in terms of pr practice or training is that most people don't spend their time as wisely as they should for, for accelerated learning and, and faster skill acquisition. So with this chart, uh, this is this is showing what is more an ideal split up of your time of practice. So say you have um, the morning, three hours. You want to warm up. 
So get things moving, but only spend 10% of those, say three hours or two and a half hours doing that. Okay. So get, get things moving. Then you want to actually get, get into this 70% challenge zone. Um, so yeah, spend 70% of your time with skills that are just outside of your current sort of ability. Okay. And I'll get into what, like how far out of your current comfort zone you need to get for it to be in this, in this challenge zone. And it's not much, but you want to spend most of the time challenging yourself in the deep end for one of a sort of a better phrase. And then in this, in this time, you want to spend the last bit of it sort of more back in your comfort zone. So 20% of the time in your comfort zone. And what it seems to be is people spend, uh, they, they do it opposite. They'll warm up for 10% of the time and then they'll spend 70% of their time in the comfort zone. And then at the end of that or somewhere in there, they'll go, oh, I'll just challenge myself a little bit. Oh, that was pretty hard. And then come back into the comfort zone. That's not where the learning really happens. And back to like struggling you, in, this, in this area here, you don't usually struggle. But so many people go, oh, I can do a short turn down ballroom pretty well i'll go there and i'll just you know because that's that's my comfort zone i can i can work on it in in that space instead of perhaps going well i actually really don't like doing it down high noon that that bottom bit and and spending yeah most of your time doing that so this is like a really important thing to first uh like get wrap your head around and it comes from like one, one of the guys that basically talks about this he is one of a handful of people that can juggle about 13 things in the air at once. So he was in the Cirque du Soleil and the way he approached getting better at stuff was 70% of his time challenging his, uh, his skills. So in, in skiing, since we're all here for skiing, um, a great way to kind of challenge yourself, spend time in the challenge zone is drills. And, you know, a lot of the time we give drills to, uh, students if we're teaching them but very often we don't do enough drills ourselves and drills are great because they exaggerate things like say this in rigger drill here exaggerating like edge angle flexion of the inside leg to a to really big degree more than you know perhaps a normal physical range of movement you're going through um, perhaps going at a slower pace so changing the timing of how yes. you're usually no, receiving things cool yeah so drills are great for exaggerating all these uh different things um sometimes it might be facing your fear of like skiing on one one ski um but uh outside of that this 70 percent of the time spent in this challenging zone of um what you're doing you don't have to do it in terms of like like i said the exact the example of ballroom so an easier blue run versus a harder blue run like high noon you don't have to do something that's really like scary difficult or scary challenging okay that's one one thing it could just be actually slowing it like right down so even challenging you rushing things so you do really detailed slow snow plows trying to work on turning your leg or something like that but but the the uh the main message here is get out of your comfort zone do more time uh, spent spent doing that stuff, and and I think personally drills are uh, some of the best. So there's there's all you really need to challenge yourself um, based on some research to like get yourself uh, stimulated and to put yourself in that in that challenging your skill uh, sort of level, and it's really small, like not much. Um, which is kind of nice to know. You don't have to be right, like going that much faster or you know changing things that much to really get a benefit and accelerate things. So I like this number, and I even think about it in terms of just my general life, um, because like like in terms of business, like if I've got to take on something, can, if it's like four percent out of my kind of comfort zone of what I'm currently doing, my if my business or somewhere around there. I go, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's good. That's going to challenge how I currently do things. And I'm okay with that. So it's kind of like this cool number to, um, to think about. So that's all you need to do 
to uh, to reap some benefits there. Because what it does that that four percent often is it it sort of piques your curiosity and makes the experience kind of novel. So this is like a, a frame grab from me doing some retraction extension turns um, in, in Silver Star. In fact, Luke, I don't know, you might have even filmed this one. Um, <clears throat> now, like retraction extension turns, I'm, I'm way lower in the transition than I do for, for normal turns, especially for the speed. I was going not that fast. And so I was exaggerating things and it's, it's definitely like really absorbing when you do that, when you are exaggerating things and doing them in a different way that challenges what you normally habitually do. You become curious in, in what's going on. Um, so that was a really bad spelling mistake there, but uh, yeah, make things novel because this keeps you focused and that's one thing that people talk about like all the time in terms of learning something you've got to be focused so like right now have your you know looking at your computer screen not having your phone on you know screen facing up like those sorts of things this this day and age it's so easy to get distracted and lose focus uh be in a training group and your friend starts talking to you all those sorts of, sorts of things get in the way of like creating a flow state and being able to really maximize your practice time and get better at something. So key words I'll just say here is like, like, like this, make it novel, make it interesting. So you're curious with what you're doing. Key part in, uh, in working on learning something and, and, and especially for guests too, right? Thinking, because I'm also talking about this in terms of teaching. Like, don't just repeat the same old, same old, like, because it'll come across to the person as, as um, like, they'll, they'll sense that. So keep things interesting for, for them too. And it only has to be 4%. You're not trying to put people in scary situations, that sort of thing, just, just a little bit out of their comfort zone. So I thought it's worth, import, uh, it's worth bringing up, uh, tr like, training. So training clinics. Training is important to go and do, but it's also important to practice without interruption. And so I guess I'm speaking to people here who are chronic, um, tra like training clinic junkies, and they think more training clinics equals I'm going to get better. And listening to more and more different people, I'm going to get better. That's not necessarily uh, true or in a condensed period such as this upcoming ski season. Uh, if you, you'd be better off kind of finding someone that you gel with or one person, even if you don't, if they give you just one good idea, taking that idea, going away and working on it yourself without interruption. Because, you know, myself running clinics, there's, you know, there's all these people coming along. So I've got to sort of change and think about it. Has this guy got something out of it? Has this guy, has this girl got something out of it? I need to constantly sort of maybe change the message that, that might've worked well for him, but not for her. But, but if you're a clinic junkie, you, you tend to like get distracted and keep thinking the next thing that's going to be said is the most important thing. So you kind of keep discarding ideas instead of taking one going away and working on it. So putting that in there just to remember, yeah, it just uh, can throw you off your, um, your practice and, and improvements in the season. This one is, uh, is, is super cool. And I think really important to um, keep in mind. It's got to do with expectations, like 1% improvements in whatever you're doing add up pretty fast. And so how might that look? Say you go out, you're working on your short turns and out of that whole, so maybe, you know, hour, or even half an hour you go out before before work, you feel like, you know, half of half of uh, one run out of six runs was half, you know, good. You felt the thing that you needed to feel. That is all you need to know you're improving. So many people come back and focus on the the negatives and the things that didn't go well. And then they still keep focusing on uh, on those areas, and that they're not getting better faster because they com you're comparing yourself to other people. 
And if you look at video, for example, and you don't, video is hard because it's hard to make things look really different. Habits are hard to break. But if you can see a 1% improvement in a video or, you know, out of a whole entire time, you got some, uh, some changes, that's all you need because it adds up. And I think there's a good story. The British cycling team, for example, before the London Olympics, they had a, a new team manager, coach, and they basically worked on all these 1% things, like the um, materials that they were making their uniforms out of, getting everyone really properly set up on their bikes, like everyone on the same uh, eating plan, sleeping plan. When they'd go away on camps, they'd bring their own pillows, like all these like small things that seemingly unrelated to these one percenters added to them totally kicking ass in uh, in the olympics so one percent improvements add up that's all you're really looking for which takes some kind of uh pressure off yourself so on that i don't think enough people video themselves make sure you take time find a video partner someone that you can trade uh you know phone videos with because no one's got an excuse anymore everyone's got a got a phone so you can video yourself so make sure you get out there and do this because you know what you think you're doing versus what's happening in reality often are, are really different that's one and then two you want to be able to kind of track and see the one percenters perhaps you you go out there and you're working on your arm position your pole plant whatever it is your, your stance and that's the one thing you're trying to do when you watch video and you focus just on that compared to the last time you did it with video you're more likely to be able to capture say that one percent that time when you did get it right and so you can focus on it so make sure you video yourself so this is just one of my on, online students from this this season and it's probably three or four days apart and um, this is before a drill gave him. So he's working on this up and over drill uh, in between the two shots. And, you know, pretty much the same point past the camera. Yes, that's a bit blurry, but you can see this, this subtle change, which he felt as ginormous change um, is visible. And um, so, you know, he, was, he, he, he felt it. We can see it. It's kind of measurable. Uh, these things all help lead to you like like a confirmation of yes i'm going to keep doing this process what got me from here to here i spent you know an hour each day doing this drill really focusing on the key elements that, that make it a success and then i did a free ski run that looked like that because you're trying to build like if you follow this kind of formula you'll start building habits because if this season you start to be able to change things. You do it differently. You don't go to every single clinic, but you do go to some, and then you go away and practice and you focus, you get video, and you just think about small improvements and you don't challenge yourself too much, but you challenge yourself a little, little bit. And it all starts working out. You're going to remember season 2023 and go, I'm going to repeat that. And then so you're going to do it again. And then you're going to get it another change in a different part of your skiing again and again and again. And then you look back five years, 10 years time, and maybe now you are on the demo team and, or, you know, you're, uh, you're in the Threadbo media, you know, they want you to ski in front of the camera because you're the best, uh, best, most smoothest looking skier out there, whatever your goal is. But the, all these things will lead to building habits uh, in your, like the way you perceive your skiing, um, the, sorry, the way you perceive like getting things done. So um, yeah, pay attention to that. So pretty short uh, presentation here, but it's not rocket science. It's just some stuff that I've learned and uh, has worked for me over the time. So first of all, the expectations part, I put that in uh, more to do with this, like looking for 1% gains um, and and really being like, okay with that don't expect to be improving massively all the time um also that you don't have to be really macking it down the hill or, or really challenging yourself seriously to get to get some change it's as little as four percent in fact this is kind of a sweet spot uh, around four percent 
which yeah makes makes it uh it's not as daunting remember that struggling is part of the process so yeah you got to feel like uh yeah the, 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 if the struggle is not there then you're not challenged you're not doing probably enough enough of this but also remember if it's a real struggle perhaps you're pushing that four percent point maybe a little too far Really try and remember to spend 70% of your practice time challenging your skills, uh, like instead of 70% of your time being in your comfort zone. So, you know, your time is precious. You're working, you're working, working, and then you get a chance to actually have a break and, uh, you know, or take a day off, a morning off. Don't just go do the same old, same old. If you want to get better, push yourself. Spend 70% of your time pushing yourself and then come back and finish in that, uh, that that easier sort of comfort zone spot uh there's that four uh, percent and then focus just remember like yeah just just like i can't i needed to get away from uh what i was doing down at my house today to write this like go over and make sure my presentation was right if i kept getting interrupted it's going to be all over the shop so same with your skiing like you know it's great to go skiing with your friends but if you when you're going and doing your runs don't get distracted, focus on, on, on what's going on and find stuff that is novel. So that comes back to that's the same as this challenge thing. So working on a drill within what you're doing that is slightly challenging, uh, pushing the terrain or the speed um, either up or down, really, really important there. And then, yeah, video yourself. Make sure you video yourself. People do not, I think, do that enough to keep themselves honest um great so that's really all i wanted to talk about before this season and hopefully give you some ideas on yeah how to approach the winter and if you're not you know if something you're working on is your teaching you can utilize this stuff to help your guests um yeah especially if they're motivated you've got inter school kids like novel things really interesting things are going to make it you know, the, the kids are going to learn faster. They're going to have a more interesting time. Um, and that's what I was going to say. The last thing about, about flow state, people have maybe, you know, you've heard of this, like getting in, in the flow and that sort of thing. And, and in flow state, people report, you know, things slowing down, like the matrix, you can see things coming, um, make reactions sort of like, like you've got time. Um, anyway, some, some research on that shows there's these sort of stages that people go through to, to hit that flow state. And one of them is this struggling bit. And so this struggling bit occurs, but then usually uh, what happens just after that is almost this release of, of like getting out of, so say you've been, so I'll just give a skateboarding example. You, you can't do a kickflip. You're there, you're trying to do a kickflip, kick, kickflip, kickflip for like half an hour. You do like 150 of them. Some of them you get right, some of them not. And you're there, you're like, oh, exhausted. You have a break. What really helps trigger the next part where you actually often will get into flow is you go and do something completely different and in, within your comfort zone. So say you, do, you could do ollies. You then go skate for 10 minutes just doing ollies, totally enjoying it, something that's well within your comfort zone. Come back, go through the challenge one again. You will find... What has happened is there's been chemical reactions in your brain that have changed and released uh, certain chemicals that help you learn. It helps block out like that, that critical thinking part of your brain, like, oh, you're not doing it right. Oh, you're doing this, that sort of stuff. So you come back to the challenging task and it often goes better. Now, if you think about that, that relates really well to the 70% challenge chunk 20% comfort zone. So you spend a shite load of time challenging, doing short turns at a much faster rhythm than you're used to. And then you go and you spend 20%, you know, 10 minutes doing short turns of the rhythm you, you're used to, then come back again. Suddenly it gets easier. So there's a good little kind of formula uh, that goes in there to help, you know, sort of almost hack the flow state a little bit. But you can't get in there if you just stick within your comfort zone thanks for uh for tuning in i'll uh if anyone's got questions be uh great to 
hear from you. So you can come off mute if you like, and or just let me know what what you're perhaps thinking from that you're going to add into your training this year or your way of approaching the ski season. Anyone kind of has this triggered any thoughts on that front? Like, ah, I'm going to do that. <clears throat> Yeah. Hey, look, thanks so much, Tom. A uh, heap of great, great information there to help get us uh, thinking about how we approach the season and uh, quite a lot of information. I think if, if each of us has one, one takeaway from that, then it's, it's been worthwhile. And, and certainly for me, it's been thinking about, sorry, I've got the kids in the, in the background of my dinner. That's um, right. the, the, the one for me is definitely thinking about that, that 70% of the time that I'm out, out skiing in my own time, 70% should be trying to get better. Cause I always, <clears throat> I always think there's three states of mind, that I can have when I'm skiing. Um, one is to perform, two is to develop, or three is to cruise. So cruising, just not really thinking about anything, just going with it. Developing, thinking about thinking about an aspect of your skiing that you're, you're trying to work on and develop. And perform is not thinking about one specific thing, but trying to absolutely ski to the best of your ability. And I think maybe I need to think about the percentages that I'm, I'm, I'm making to those zones across the season because, you know, particularly for myself in, in switching jobs in recent years, my times are even time on snow is even more of a premium. I need to get more more value from that time. So that will certainly, uh, yeah, that's been been quite worthwhile there. Yeah, totally. I, I loved hearing that just knowing <laughs> like some kind of rough numbers was was helpful. It's like, right, I know I've got an hour. I'm going to spend 40 minutes of that doing shit that is harder, uh, to, you know, stuff that I know I don't really like doing because mistakes always happen, but you just got to go through that, um, to, yeah, to improve, uh, Nick, have you got a takeaway you're going to implement? I only just joined in the last couple of minutes, mate. So I didn't hear the whole thing, but, um, just, uh, I think alongside with James, the, um, like spending a certain amount of time trying hard stuff um, certainly lines up with a lot of research I've been doing uh, as part of the demo team for uh, the next sort of uh, teaching section of the APSI manual. Um, there's a lot of sort of research in neuroscience that you, yeah, you, you need a certain error rate to trigger neuroplasticity. Um, and it's somewhere, yeah, somewhere roughly around what you've said there. So um yeah, so kind of. It's cool to hear. Yeah, to hear you mention that, like, say yeah. that sort of stuff because it's sort of like, okay, well, that. Yeah, um, I'm can, going down the right path. Think of a, can you think of a personal example of when you perhaps just did that? You know, maybe it was someone you skied with just forced you for that whole entire morning. You're like, this is way out of my depth, but then maybe yeah, like I, that I afternoon think or I've the had next, that, like. A number of like yeah heaps of times yeah um actually uh uh we're skiing with sam robbo in burby a couple of weeks ago um yeah and he's just sort of um we're just talking about skiing he's like yeah you should try and clear your inside leg a little bit more um and yeah after like sort of watching robbo do it a bit and then i sort of took it away for a couple of days and was like okay i'm gonna go and just go and practice this and practice this and practice this and yeah, there was definitely a lot of times where I was like, oh, I wasn't clearing it at the right rate or something, or, you know, I ended up on the inside ski or whatever, but just fuck it up, fuck it up, fuck it up. And then eventually kind of starts, you start to get it right. Got the breakthrough. Yeah. Games. yeah. 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 That's what I like reflecting back on thinking, why did that, I seem to go faster working on that thing. And I think back to it and the situation, the people, whatever it was kind of forced me into that uh that challenge zone for longer mm. uh brian how about you um I, i'm re i'm reminded of something from a a different sector which is the and i'm old enough to have the perspective the which was the do it on be alone and be uninterrupted and that was i know that was two separate points but they, they're related and there's there's a bit of uh theory about um, particularly creative situations or, or, or research and development of new ideas um, in the way the brain works and a suggestion that with the advent of email and text messages and a whole range of things that across so many different uh, industrial sectors or commercial sectors um, now influence the way people spend their lives, that we've lost the creativity that comes from a 45-minute period 
uninterrupted focusing on a single thing. And and over the last, and that's, you know, this isn't new news. 10 or 15 years ago, this was understood and large corporations started reacting to that because they could see it affecting productivity in the areas of their business, which were, you know, trying to create new things like project work, software development, things where you need to, to make a breakthrough of some sort in a new concept. And learning to ski better is another example of getting that breakthrough. So those two resonated with something that I've heard as a, you know, as a guy trying to run a bank, you know, part of a bank, yeah. for example. And when you, yes. most of your team are just spending their life reacting to emails rather than stopping and thinking about what they really need to get right, to get past this struggle that they've dipped in and out of. Absolutely, so that, yeah. That, was, that resonated for me and it was useful to apply that to this this weird thing that I don't actually intend or have any aspiration to join the demo team eventually, Nick, but um, I do actually have an aspiration to improve my skiing a bit beyond where I am. So um, that's right. Some of it is not getting distracted by the fact that I quite like skiing around with a, with a class. Maybe I've got to spend 45 minutes skiing on my own. Yeah, absolutely. And do you know what, when you're with the class, we over teach so much of the time because we we take that role so yes. seriously that we presented oh god there's still an hour to go i can't just stand here and let them practice actually as long as they're given some novelty in the task is, is sort of set that's exactly what we all need and you can work on your own thing the guests can work on their own thing but yeah people need that focus and we as an instructor can be a distraction if we're constantly in their ear a, a lot of the time and I'll just share one more thing on that. Archie, my five-year-old, uh, really into soccer, really into sports. I've realized I've perhaps been a little bit too heavy in terms of uh, external feedback to him on, hey, great dribbling, great kick, instead of leaving him be and trying to let the outcome trigger his own internal, like that felt really good. I'll do it again. Because I don't want him to rely on me going great kick or someone else great kick. And then no one's saying great kick. And then suddenly like, oh, I'm not interested in this anymore. So students, your ski students, whether they're just snow playing, whatever it is, I think you got to be careful. Try You're trying to set up a situation where they uh, get the self perpetuated. Yeah. Internal feed, feedback. We, we all want to be the one sort of taking credit for it at times and yeah james you got something to mention there yeah i so setting up setting up um you know intrinsic feedback loops are so so important to accelerate learning and yeah. um, you know i think we we all know how it's quite easy to, you talk to you talked about clinic junkies and we've all come across feedback junkies who who you know we'll have on a course and they'll come down a run and, and they're just waiting for the trainer to say something to them and we've all had students in a lesson who come down and they want the trainer to to uh to give them that feedback they want that reassurance from from their voice from the professional that they're they're employing or that they're coming to for training and um but the the, the real skill in getting them to take ownership from their own learning is uh is in setting up those those loops of feedback that don't come from the trainer that they can tap into after the lesson and in their own personal training time which should account for way more than their their time with a, a trainer or, or a teacher um, but if we don't set those up <clears throat> it's quite difficult for them to know whether they're they're achieving what they're setting out to achieve or not and it might be like the sound the skis are making it might be the tracks that are left in the snow it might be a particular um feeling that they're experiencing against the boot or from a, a um from muscular effort they're making um we can, we can tap into to so many of those and really the, the last one we resort to should be from from the trainer once we've once we've Kind of once we got them through that cognitive phase of learning, they're in that associative phase where they're, they're practicing lots. Um, trying to trying to encourage them to to tap into things that aren't new is so important. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think recognizing if you're that person, because <laughs> I think we all, you know, I know I've turned to people and go, "Did what did you think? Was that kind of good?" Like. We've all been there, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've all been there. But yeah, hopefully this there's just this little sort of slideshow of things. Just you can come back to it, check it, check it, check it 
are you doing some of the things in there that perhaps are going to lead to to, to faster you know learning growth in, in what you're doing um yeah anyone else want to do a final sort of takeaway from this discussion um yeah just what you said about like trying something hard for a period of time and struggling with it and then going back to something else that you know you can do and you know is fun like i've had a lot of experience with that skateboarding especially so like if i was learning to kick flip or heel flip or like all of the tricks i've learned i've had like maybe a morning period where i've tried to do it 100 200 300 times and then go on all right let's just go and do fun stuff that i already know how to do for a little bit and then i'll come back in an hour's time and then maybe three or four different tricks i've done it that first time after the break and it's click magically happened yeah um, yeah so, so now you, you know that, there's, I went, there's a formula yeah 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 it's kind of like like yeah you knew it in the time you were kind of sort of stumbling on it but but yeah there's some pretty smart people that have basically figured this out by studying some of the extreme athletes in the world uh this guy's named Stephen kotler by the way that's done a lot of his flow research and that's what he's found there's these certain patterns and so there's little hacks you can sort of do to help repeat the process and we're all creatures of habit that that habit part there i I reckon that's a really important one because if you've learned all this now and you've got this season this season is a chance to start developing a seasonal habit of getting better in one area and i then i would also suggest choose probably one thing for that season so i know some some seasons i came in i was like i'm just going to get better at a really good dynamic short turn like that's 70 percent of where when i go skiing i'm going to be doing that type of turn and then challenging it so uh in that season try and develop a yeah this recipe a habit so then you just naturally just come back in next year you don't have to think about as much you just nap you you gravitate towards got 30 minutes off i go do this you don't even like think about anything else you just know what to do and uh and it starts happening so yeah i I saw you nodding your head with the kick flips there as well luke i was like oh didn't realize you skated water a lot but yeah that's why so like just so you know more records have been broken in extreme sports than any anything else in such a short period of time and part of what it is is because extreme sports naturally always that they're usually challenging us that little bit as soon as you start doing it you're already kind of hitting that four percent zone uh of of challenging your skill but you get to sort of levels where perhaps some of the people on the call here are at don't fall into complacency do things faster, you know, rhythm, faster speed, trickier terrain, harder snow, constrain yourselves, do it now with no poles, do it now with on one ski, and that, that'll that lead to uh, to growth. Great. All right, everyone. Thanks very much for joining. Thanks, James, for uh, the opportunity to, to do this. And, uh, yeah, I'd love to hear. It'd be cool to do like a season end wrap-up one and, see who's who's done well and uh yeah what they've what they've achieved and what's worked worked there